Welcome to the Aaron Harbor Show. My guest today is Governor John Hickenlooper. Welcome back to the show, John. Glad to be back, Aaron. Great to see you. Love having you on the show, and we're uh, in your home in the governor's mansion. Thank you very much for uh, allowing us to use your home as our set. No, it's fun to show it off. It's, it's gorgeous, and I love the flowers. You know, um, it's been so much fun. Uh, when you first came on the show and, and you were running the brewery, um, when you walked in the studio, I thought they had got Bill Gates for the show. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then uh, you had this marvelous campaign for mayor, uh, two terms as mayor of Denver, uh, with extraordinary range of accomplishments. I think you, you really surprised uh, a lot of people. Uh, the number of bond issues that got passed, the, the way you reshaped and changed and improved Denver so much. Uh, and then now two terms as, as governor as well. Did, did you think that was going to happen when uh, you were in college, for example? Oh, no. You know, I went back to college and uh, I was a commencement speaker in 2010. And to a person, all, all the, the, the guys from my class, the, the president of the university came up to our dinner and said, how many of you thought Hickenlooper was the least likely to ever hold elected office? And everyone Every was. hand went up. <laughs> Uh, so I never thought about it. I never entered my mind. I, I, I never ran for student council or hung out with the people that did. Uh, but I thought that, you know, when I was running the restaurant, we got involved in the Mile High Stadium, the renaming, should the naming rights be sold, that big battle. And all these people said, you should run for mayor. You care about the city so much. And normal people should run for, for mayor and city council. I mean, the, the people that are a little nerdy, they should get involved. Well, you also had, before running for mayor, I mean, you served on a lot of boards, a lot of commissions, did a lot of philanthropic work. So uh, I think there was a core group of people who, who knew and respected you. You didn't totally come out of nowhere, but you definitely weren't in the, the list of anticipated politicians for that race. It's true. No one expected me to make a strong showing. And pretty much all the other candidates before the campaign came and tried to convince me that I didn't need to bother getting my... My, my hands dirty, that, that, that they could fulfill my, you know, what, what I wanted to do in government. You know, I wanted to make government more transparent, more accountable. I wanted, I wanted to get people to believe in government. And each one of them said, we can do that, we can do that. But I never, you know, in the, in the end, I felt that, that you needed somebody from the outside who'd never been in government before. So one of the things, I mean, the transition, running a business, uh, a very successful business, uh, and really being part of the revitalization of Lodo, uh, then becoming mayor and then governor, how would you describe your management style? And, and how have you had to change it uh, to adapt from that, those different transitions? Well, certainly the, when I was running the restaurants, we were very collaborative and not just within our own company, with our own employees, but the, the way we related to other restaurants in Lodo, we got them all to, we started buying pint glasses together with McCormick's. Uh, we did ads together with all the other restaurants in Lodo to kind of define Lodo as a place. And I think that collaborative style works very well in, in government. In other words, it's one of the things that's really lacking. Why wasn't Denver working together with the suburbs and collaborating on you know, transit or, or public safety issues like that? And then in terms of my own, uh, the employees, you know, you try to build a team. You try to take your own strengths and weaknesses and, and be objective. Uh, and so I'm not great at detail, right? I, I love big ideas. I, I, I think through talking. I'm dyslexic, so I'm a slow reader. Well, I need people that are great readers and can read and, and go into deep, complicated uh, reports and understand them. Uh, I have a great sense of urgency, but sometimes I, I move a little too fast. So I need people that are maybe a little more cautious, will try and slow me down. Uh, you, you look for the people that can fill in, you know, your, your weaknesses and, and, and create a team. And that's, you know, I've been so blessed over the years to have, like, chiefs of staff, amazingly talented. Michael Bennett was my first chief of staff, then Cole Finnegan. Kelly Bruff now runs the Metro Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Roxanne White was probably the, the greatest chief of staff any, any governor or mayor ever had. And each of them... We're, we're almost perfect partners to, to complement, you know, basically they filled in for my weaknesses in many ways. So in terms of some of the accomplishments that you've, that you've had, what, what do you look back on so far? And you still have time to do more, but what are some of the accomplishments that, that you're most proud of? In a lot of different areas, when I was, uh, when I was with the city as mayor, uh, we really did build a collaborative effort between the suburb, the regional area. And so we end up finding all kinds of evidence of that. Fast tracks, 
If you look at one of the reasons millennials are flocking to metropolitan Denver right now, it's because we put we made that investment into light rail and, and young people don't want to own cars. They want to be in a community that has good transit. Uh, so I think that was very significant. Also, the other investments we made on a, on a very collaborative way. We also cut red tape and, and regulation. We showed that government could be smaller. In the eight years I was mayor, we actually ended up with 7% fewer employees than we did when we started. No other mayor ever did that. And we, we tried to show people that government can be smaller and yet do more for its people. Uh, on the state level, you know, we've really tried to take that collaborative spirit on a, on a larger basis and take the, you know, the notion of entrepreneurship. You know, entrepreneurs aren't just to make money. You can be an entrepreneur in public service. And so we came in and said, all right, how are we going to get the state to be pro-business, recognized not just as a destination for vacations and go to resorts, but a place where a young entrepreneur would want to come start a business. So we cut red tape, we increased access to capital so you know, small businesses could get loans more easily. Uh, we focused on branding the state, not just as a tourist destination, but as a great place to not just build a, a business, but build a family, build a life. Uh, you know, that, that kind of changing the state from being you know, more of a recreational ideal to a, a place that's pro-business in many, many ways and, and, and getting it known as that. I mean, that's part of the reason why our economy, I think, has been so strong. What do you think the biggest challenges in government today are? Um, and, and how, you know, given your history in business and government, how have those challenges changed? Is there a difference between how things were a decade or more ago and, and how they are today? Well, certainly 20 years ago, <clears throat> it's like night and day. Uh, 10 years ago, still a big difference. Uh, obviously, politics has gotten nastier and dirtier since big corporate money has come into the campaigns. Uh, the attack ads are relentless, and that turns people off. And, you know, democracy, American democracy is a fragile institution. Uh, we're the only democracy like this in the world that, is, that has lasted this long. And yet, if people are so grossed out by the, just the negative nature of campaigns, then they stop paying attention to the issues. And, and that's, you know, that's an essential ingredient of democracy. People have to understand what the issues are and understand the difference. So, so all that big money into elections has been probably not healthy. Uh, and then I think the second thing is, the, the, uh, if you, you again step back and look at the media, as the technology and the internet has read, led to the fragmentation of the media, and the big institutions have really been diluted. So the major TV networks, uh, uh, you know, all the, the traditional newspapers don't have the readership, don't have the the push certain magazines, again, their impact is diluted. You tie that in with, with a fragmented media, people don't seem to, to demand and aren't sure that they're getting the real facts. And people become very skeptical of what they hear uh, elected officials or politicians say. That makes it really hard. I mean, you know, when I first got into this, you know, 14 years ago, part of that impulse was to get people to believe in government. It was a, I mean, it's a big reason that I was willing to give up all the privacy and put up with a bunch of the baloney that you put up with in these jobs. Uh, I thought it was worth it to get people to believe in government. And when the media is so fractured and there's so much distortion and, and outright lies that people you know, throw out there, and there's no, there's no standard media to challenge them and say, hey, that's not true. Uh, it, it just makes the whole job a lot harder. All right, well, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back with Governor Hickenlooper, uh, and he'll get to tell me about some of his failures uh, in his leadership position. I think that the, the, the hospital provider fee would have allowed us to put, you know, to, to do a 25-year bond and, and, you know, get $5 billion to really make an impact on our, our transportation system. And in the end, we could never get it out of committee. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. Hi, I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. Because I've never done endorsements or commercials, people ask how are our programs funded? 
especially because we provide them as a public service to our broadcast outlets. It's expensive to produce our show, whether we do them here in Denver or go to places such as Aspen, Washington, D.C., or even Iraq. The answer is we depend on contributions to support our work to bring you some of the nation's top opinion leaders. Individuals, businesses, foundations, and other nonprofits make tax-deductible contributions to the Democracy and Media Education Foundation to help allow us to continue to work for you. To find out more or to make a donation, just go to dmefd.org. The DMEF is a tax-exempt public charitable organization and has promised to dedicate 100% of every contribution to support our public affairs initiatives. If you believe, as I do, in the need for a forum which promotes civil discourse and mutually respectful discussion, I hope you'll decide to make a contribution today. Join me and watch The Aaron Harbor Show. 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 I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch The Aaron Harbor Show and keep hope alive. The Aaron Harbor Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at www.harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. We're with Governor John Hickenlooper. So, John, uh, I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts about um, your failures, things that, that didn't work out, uh, and, and events or uh, efforts that maybe you'd even like to take back. So give, give me uh, 10 or 20 examples. Well, yeah, I could give you 50 probably. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, One or two is fine. I think that the challenge often is, is, A, it's did you get the right answer? But then probably even more important is, is when you got that answer, did you communicate it properly? Did you let people know? You know, with, there was a huge conflict over the gun safety issues. And should we have universal background checks? And you know, we went forward after the shootings in the Aurora movie theater, you know, 70 people shot, 12 people killed. Uh, and we, we engaged in universal background checks that next year, the next, next legislative session. And we really didn't talk about it, didn't get the facts out there ahead of time. And when we went back and looked at the facts in, in Colorado, getting to, <clears throat> we were doing background checks for half the gun purchases. And we, we never had gone back and gone to the public and said, here's what, you know, what happened in Colorado last year with these background checks. We, we had the national data, but we didn't use the Colorado data. And the Colorado data, 38 people convicted of homicide had you know, tried to buy a gun and we'd stop them. That was just getting to half the gun safety. People, 133 people convicted of sexual assault. So that kind of stuff, that, those facts we didn't do. Um, but I've also had failures where I didn't uh, push hard enough or, or negotiate successfully the, most recently, the hospital provider fee, which is a huge issue for the state of Colorado. I mean, we are, the traffic gets worse and worse. We have no resources to build, to expand our highway system and, and, and ease a lot of that congestion or expand our light rail to continue to remove cars, you know, get people out of their cars. Uh, and, you know, I don't think, <clears throat> I think I could have done a better job of, of reaching out to the, the, the folks that were opposed. It's a relatively small number of people opposed. I think that the, the the hospital provider fee would have allowed us to put, you know, to, to do a 25-year bond and, and, you know, get $5 billion to really make an impact on our, our transportation system. And in the end, we could never get it out of committee in the state Senate. And, and somehow, you know, I look at that, I'm not sure what I could have done, to be frank, but, but I should have done something. I mean, that, it's just too important to the state that we had every Chamber of Commerce supports the hospital provider fee, every... Uh, the Colorado Association of Commerce and Industry, every business group, literally every, every newspaper in the state uh, supported it, and yet we, we couldn't get it done. Okay, and for viewers who, who don't know about this, the hospital provider fee already is in place. Funds are already being collected. And really all you are asking to do is to reclassify exactly. the fee. And it, my understanding is to reclassify it in a manner consistent with how similar fees are classified. Right. The, the, the fees all over, I mean, the, the attorney general said this is a perfectly legal. The former attorney general, John Souther, said not only is it legal, this is what I advised them to do back in 2009 when they created this fee, is treat it like a fee. Don't treat it like as if it's extra income that would count towards the Tabor, the Tabor cap. Uh, and for whatever reason, in 2009, we were so far away from the cap, they said, oh, well, it's never going to come up. Why go through the political uh, challenges now? 
well, it turns out that that would have been the right time to do it. Right. And it's hundreds of millions of dollars. Hundreds of millions of dollars. Every year. And I think in terms of things like roads and, and higher education, I mean, we're going to squeeze out our capacity to fund transportation and higher education if we don't, do, if we don't resolve some of these, these issues. So how do you solve that particular problem? I think you, you need to sit down with the people that are you know, opposed to it and, and try to listen harder. I mean, I, that sounds weird, but you know, my experience, and this is, I learned this in the restaurant business, uh, if you're trying to persuade someone to do something that they don't want to do, don't try and tell them what you think is right. They don't care about that. Try to listen more closely to what they are saying and figure out what, in their self-interest, what is a way that you can figure out a win-win. At least to, to some extent, there's something in it for both sides. Um, before I go into some specific, other specific issues, um, looking ahead, uh, what would you like to, to do uh, with the rest of your term? What, what are your priorities? What would you like to accomplish? Well, you know, we've made a lot of progress in making Colorado the most pro-business state, but with the highest environmental standards. You know, we've got methane regulations for a state to do that. We uh, really address things like, uh, on, a, on a variety of levels, making sure that we have a clean, safe environment. But we could be pro-business. Uh, I want to keep pushing that. I want to make this the best place to, to start a business and raise a family uh, in the country. Uh, and part of that, we have some s specific issues, the workforce, uh, training issues. You know, 70% of our kids never are going to get a four-year degree or even a junior college degree. We know that, and yet we don't put as much effort into them as we do with trying to get everybody to go to college. So we're, we're pushing very hard, with partnering with LinkedIn to create a, we're calling it Skillful. And Skillful is a website that will, you can click on any junior college or college course and not only see what books you read, but also see what skills you'll get. And then you can click on those skills, it'll show what kind of jobs that would prepare you for. Click on those jobs, it'll show you who's hiring and what they're paying right now on those jobs. So it really collapses that space between a, a, a potential employer and a potential employee. Uh, we want to expand that and tie it to apprenticeships. So kids, when they're 17, maybe instead of their last two years of high school, they can go work in a bank or an insurance company or anywhere and work three days a week, and then two days a week go back to their school or go back to a, go to a community college and take classes that help them in their job, but also will get them to a, you know, make sure that they get a, 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 their high school degree at the same time so that they're actually working, and, and a lot of those classes will count towards a college degree at some point if they want to do that. And so taking the the LinkedIn, the skillful partnership, and tying that with this notion of apprenticeships. I mean, that's one way I think we can really accelerate how Colorado gets kids ready for the jobs that are coming. And at the same time, look at all those 45 and 55 year old people that have lost their careers. You know, all these innovations in technology have eliminated entire careers. This will allow us, we can, when we scale this, I really believe this will allow us to look at how do we take people, look at like a bank teller. Bank tellers have to be very, they have to have a high degree of precision. They have to be numerate. They have to be able to work with others. Uh, the good bank tellers become managers of bank tellers. Well, when you look at what, for cybersecurity, when we're trying to train someone around cybersecurity, they need to be numerate. They need to have a high degree of precision. They have to, you know, for most, many of these jobs, they have to be able to work with others in a collaborative system. I mean, why aren't we training, we have a lot less bank tellers now because of you know, technology. Why aren't we training the people that have lost their careers into, you know, in six months we can get them into a cybersecurity job and they're gonna make 60 grand a year and you know, they've already got a lot of the skills that they need. Great idea. Um, last question for this segment, education. I mean, I know you've been so involved with K through 12 education as mayor, even though technically the, the school district is separate from uh, the mayor's office in the city and county of Denver. You were very involved in, in trying to uh, help the schools make progress. Why have we uh, done so poorly in the K through 12 arena in terms of getting kids through the system successfully? What, you know, it's, it's been a subject of so much discussion and analysis, but when you look at the results, uh, our, our ability to improve just seems to be constantly stymied. Why is that, uh, if, if you feel that's true, and what can we do? Well, we have seen some very encouraging results in Colorado, and uh, both in Denver Public Schools, which has grown dramatically since I, when I first became mayor, uh, there were roughly you know, less than 70,000 students uh, in DPS. Now there are over 90,000 students. It's one of the, one of the most 
rapidly growing urban school districts in the country. Uh, and part of that is they're experimenting with all different kinds of systems. And you know, we've got great teachers uh, in a variety of contexts. But what we see a lot is that those schools with longer school days and, and, and schools with a longer school year really seem to perform better. And, and all their students, uh, not just the middle class kids, but even the kids from very low income families, perform better. My son Teddy finished eighth grade uh, at uh, an innovation school in Denver Public Schools, where instead of six and a half hours a day, he went to school eight hours a day, but no homework. So they do, the, they do study halls and, and the kids help each other with what would have been homework. So it changed our relationship, right? When he comes home, we would go out, shoot baskets, kick the soccer ball, you know, go to a movie uh, on those nights when I'm lucky enough to be home. Not every night, unfortunately. Uh, but that school is one of the top performing middle schools in the state with no homework, right? For sixth graders, seventh graders, eighth graders. Uh, so that longer school day seems to work. Now there are other things you need that the, the, these high performing schools, both public schools and charter schools uh, have. Uh, they, they have a strong uh, school culture. Usually they have t-shirts or some kind of simple uniform. They have meetings every morning where they get the whole school together frequently. That's a common denominator of many of these schools. Uh, the kids are trained to kind of help police themselves, you know, make their own rules, be their own authority. Uh, I think we should be looking at, at what clearly does work and, and then begin to expand that to the whole school districts to entire school districts. At, again, this is local control, so the school districts have to choose it. Uh, but that longer school day would probably take some more money, but not a lot. And people you know, say, well, we haven't made that much progress. I mean, Colorado is one of the lowest tax states for, in other words, we put less money per child into our schools than just about any other state. Uh, we're in the bottom six or eight states for that, and yet we're in the top 10 for how well our kids improve each year in their achievement. So, you know, we're, it doesn't feel like we're doing well enough, and we're really not, right? Especially our low-income kids are not achieving at a level that's gonna allow them to, to succeed in their pursuit of the American dream. But, but we are doing pretty good relative to how much money we're spending. All right, great. We're gonna take another quick break, and we'll be right back with Governor Hickenlooper. I wanna make uh, Colorado the worst place to make a mistake to commit a violent crime, but the best place to get a second chance. Your opinions, ideas, suggestions, and criticisms related to guests, topics, questions, or the host are welcome. Please send an email to producer at harbortv.com. Hi, I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. For information about the program, who our upcoming guests and topics are, and ways you can participate, please go to our website. That's harbortv.com. And most of all, thanks for watching. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. I very much would like to hear from you about the program, so please send me an email with your thoughts. You can suggest what topics I should cover, what guests I should invite to be on the show, or even what specific questions you would like me to ask. This is your program, so send your suggestions to Aaron at HarborTV.com. I promise to personally read every one, so email me today. And most of all, thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. It's tough for me to limit myself to 140 characters, but you can see how well I do by following the show on Twitter. Follow me at at sign Aaron Harbour. To obtain a DVD copy of this program, please contact info at harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show, our final segment with Governor John Hickenlooper. Uh, John, water is an issue, obviously huge in the West. Uh, you have the Colorado Water Plan. What's our biggest challenge in water and how do we solve it? Well, you know, once we got the Colorado Water Plan, which really did focus on conver conservation, I said every conversation should start with conservation uh, around water. It, you, you see that there is a disproportionate uh, amount of attention spent over fighting over what water we have, instead of looking at, all right, where, where can we really do save it and, and, and get everyone together? And that was the best. You know, we had over 30,000 people participated in the creation of the water plant. So obviously the urban areas have got to, you know, less bluegrass, be more con conservation minded. But also we're trying to find ways that our agricultural, our farmers and ranchers, our agricultural users can use less water as well in their creation of crops and food. 
And I think we're seeing real progress in, on both sides. How about gray water? How come there hasn't been a push for the use of gray water systems? Well, there is a push for gray water, and, and Denver, Aurora, you know, a lot of the large urban and suburban users are using gray water for, you know, for watering municipal parks and things like that where the water doesn't have to be absolutely, you know, perfect. And on the agricultural front, I mean, I live on a farm and, and we have a pivot system, we use ditch water. Um, it seems that given, I think a lot of citizens don't realize the percentage of water consumption in the state is totally dominated by the agricultural sector, 80% or so. Um, just getting ag users to conserve a tenth of the water they use would free up enough water to serve the current population of the state of Colorado. What can we do to get ag users more on board? Well, they are on board. I don't think people re uh, realize how aggressive uh, most ranchers and farmers are and I mean they understand more than anyone how valuable water is and so they they've been leading the way our laws are somewhat antiquated so it's hard for them to on a drought year you know say all right we're going to allocate water to the urban areas when they really need it the most uh, one thing we've talked about is rotational fallowing so a rancher who has you know 500 acres each year they might take 100 acres and, and let it lie fallow not grow anything and, and be able to sell that water or lease that water to a, an urban area. Right now, that's kind of against the law. Uh, and we have these antiquated water laws that we really are looking at how do we address and change those. I think if we, do, if we change the laws and get everyone working together, water's not the, I don't lie awake at night worrying about water. I think we can figure it out. All right, do you lie awake at night worrying about uh, prisons and the amount of money we spend on corrections and uh, those challenges, the high recidivism rates that, that we've experienced in the past? What, what's the real challenge there? And, and I know this is something you paid a lot of attention to and of course with the, the tragedy of your prior director being killed as well. Sure, well, the, when Tom Clements was, was essentially assassinated by a kid who'd just gotten out of prison four days before, and that kid had been in solitary confinement for some years uh, and had mental issues. We knew that. It, it just, it, what was so tragic and ironic about it was that Tom was the leader in the nation about getting kids in prison out of solitary confinement. So that, I mean, I'm not sure I'll ever completely recover from that. One of the hardest things I've ever had to deal with in, in public life without question. Uh, but we really are pushing now, uh, taking Tom's lessons and really pushing uh, so that uh, we're able to make real progress in A, when, when someone's released from prison, how do we make sure they've gotten some job training, that they're ready to you know, increase the chances that they are, are gonna you know, click this time and not just get into trouble again. Uh, and, Rick Ramish is our director of corrections now, and he is, again, a national leader in how do you reduce recidivism? In other words, recidivism is the number of people that get arrested again. I, you know, our goal, I want to make uh, Colorado the worst place to make a mistake to commit a violent crime, but the best place to get a second chance, right? In other words, we wanted these people to go through a prison process and come out and, and, and really want to be part of, you know, be part of a, be a constructive part of society. All right, well, speaking of second chances, uh, make sure you go to our website where we have a special segment with the governor about leadership, uh, but that's all the time we have for this show. Governor, thank you so much for joining me. Great to see you. I'm Aaron Harbour. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Please contact us. We want to hear from you. And thanks for watching.